The following program is paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries. See, sometimes we want things that we're going to have to really battle the devil in order to have, and we want the thing, but we don't know the first thing about battling the devil. Some people want to be out casting out devils, and they don't even have authority over a sink full of dirty dishes. Maybe some of you ought to clean your house before you worry about your ministry. Now, I can't resist going to John chapter 5. I haven't got to preach on this guy for about six months, and I just can't resist. It's my favorite story in the Bible, at least in this area of people being passive. John chapter 5, I'll just tell you a little bit of the story, and then we'll go to the verse I want to look at. They had a situation back then where when somebody was sick or crippled or diseased, there was one pool of water called the Pool of Bethesda that had some kind of a special God-type miraculous anointing on it. And one time a year, once a year only, an angel would come and stir up the waters, and these sick people lay around this pool all year waiting for the bubbling up of the water, and whoever fell into the water first received a healing. So now Jesus comes there and he sees a man who's been laying there, now, now listen to me, laying there 38 years. Now, he was crippled, we're going to give him that. But I want to tell you what, 38 years is a long time to lay somewhere. And Jesus came to him and he said, how long have you been there? I think he did it to shock the guy. So, how long have you been in the same mess? How long have you been murmuring about the same thing? <laughs> I'll talk to you. You seem to be. <laughs> I love you. I just want to help you. And I've had to go through all this. I, I, I told you the things that God says to me. You're not happy because you're selfish. Well, thanks. There was no they left with that. It was me. <laughs> well, they're selfish too. I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to you, Joyce. <laughs> Every time God gets really strong with us, we want to tell him what's wrong with everybody else. And I'm not going to stand before God and give an account for somebody else's life. I'm going to, only going to give an account for mine. And that's one thing we really have to learn is you do what's right and don't worry about what everybody else is doing. If you don't know one other human being that you think is doing what's right, you keep doing what's right. So he said to him, how long have you been in this condition? He already knew because he knows everything, but he did it to shock the man, 38 years. And then he said to him, do you really want to get well? Oh, what a question. What a question. Verse six, let's, let's put up. John 5, verse 6, when Jesus noticed him lying there helpless, knowing that he had already been a long time in that condition, he said, do you really want to get well? Are you really in earnest about getting well? And I can tell you some people don't want to get well because then they would lose their reason to murmur. Ooh, I'm preaching good today. Somebody's thinking, yes, sir, Sister Meyer, I know somebody just like that. <laughs> and the invalid said, I, this just, I just almost lose it every time I read this. It's the whole attitude that I'm talking about here today. And the invalid said, sir, I have nobody when the water's moving to put me into the pool. He's like, well, that makes sense. He was crippled. But while I'm trying to get there, Somebody else always gets ahead of me. <laughs> now look, let me just show you something. <laughs> 38 years laying by the, we're going to say this is the pool, okay? 38 years I'm laying there. That's a lot of time. Okay, I get it, I'm crippled, but the rest of me works. Surely 
Harry in 38 years. I think if he would have had any gumption about him, any determination in 38 years, I think that I could. <sighs> All right. Now, the next year when that angel comes, I'm going to fall in because I'm so on the edge of this breakthrough. Amen? I ought to try preaching down here. This is pretty comfortable too. I told some people a few weeks ago when my back was bad, I said, you know what? I figured out my gift is in my mouth, so I could really do this laying down if I had to. <laughs> so, Jesus looked at this guy and he said, get up! That's what he said to him. He just said, oh, you poor man, everybody else always gets ahead of you and you have nobody to put you in the pool. My gosh, I feel so bad for you. He said, get up. And then he said, and make up your bed. Take it with you. Some of you not only need to get up, you need to spend some time cleaning up the messes you've made all these years. Woo! Whoops. Hey, whatever it takes, if I got to crawl on the floor to get you guys to realize what I'm talking about. Don't have that attitude. Somebody else do it for me. You start asking God what you can do. Wilderness mentality number three. We are making radical progress. And I, this, I can't stand this attitude. Please make everything easy. I just can't take it if things are too hard. That wimpy, pitiful, pathetic, I can't. I, I just can't. It's just too hard. I can't. It's too much. I know I should forgive, but it's just hard. <laughs> I know I should get out of debt, but my gosh, I'm going to have to go three years without putting anything on my credit card. And I just don't think I could be happy. <laughs> Woo! You're anointed for hard things. You have the power of the Holy Spirit to help you do hard things. We don't need the power of God if we're going to just go around and do everything easy. This is too hard is one of the biggest excuses that we use. I don't even think we begin to realize how much we use that as an excuse. Well, it's just too hard. And we think that excuses us <laughs> because it's too hard. That doesn't get you out of it. That just means you need to press into God deeper. <laughs> if something's a little bit harder, then you press into God deeper. Don't have this attitude. Well, there's no way I can be happy with the life I have. <laughs> yeah, you can. If you make up your mind, you're going to be. You can find joy in the middle of your mess. You can find something to laugh about. You can find something to be appreciative for. See, there's one thing that always amazes me when you come right down to it. Bottom line is, is the answers are in here. But now listen. It's up to each one of us individually. But they, but they, but you don't understand. But they, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. <laughs> you know, I barely passed English. And I'm preaching in 40 languages to two-thirds of the world. And it's not because I'm so smart or so talented. It's because I've been a pit bull in the spirit. 
It's because I just would not give up. And it's amazing what happens if you just won't give up. The devil wants you helpless and hopeless and saying everything is too hard, it's just too hard, it's just too hard. We read some stuff about the Israelites last night in Numbers 21, 4. They always got discouraged and depressed during trials. Always. Every time things got hard, they got discouraged and they got depressed. They were led by their feelings rather than being led by the Word of God. And actually in Deuteronomy chapter 8, which was a really key chapter in the Bible for me, I can't take time now to tell you all the why is behind it, but I was just going through so many things as a young believer in ministry, and I just didn't get it, because I was like, I knew God could fix it, and He just would not. <laughs> Anybody been there? And then He brought me to Deuteronomy 8. He says, I've led you all this way, these 40 years in the wilderness, to humble you and to prove you, to test you, to see if you would keep my commandments or not that you might know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. Our life is not in having all of our circumstances the way we want them. Our life is in Christ, in knowing Him. So many good lessons that we can learn from these Israelites if we'll look. Deuteronomy 30, verse 11 through 14, I'd like us to look at these. For this commandment which I command you this day is not too hard. It's not too difficult. Everybody say, it's not too hard. Not too hard. Nor is it far off. No, you don't have to say that. <laughs> See, only do what I tell you to. <laughs> it's not a secret laid up in heaven that you should say, who's going to go up for me to heaven and make this happen in my life? <laughs> See that? It's not a secret who's going to go to heaven and bring this to me <laughs> that we may hear and do it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us? I think this is pretty amazing. It's not too hard. Stop saying it's too hard. And stop saying, well, who's going to go get it for me and bring it to me? Who's going to go over there and get it for me and bring it to me? When are they going to fix this? That we may hear and do it. But the Word is very near you, in your mouth and in your mind and in your heart, so that you can do it. <laughs> what enables you to do anything that you need to do in life? Knowing the Word and speaking the Word, especially when your circumstances stink. Instead of talking about how we feel and you know, there's a right time to talk to people and share things and, you know, kind of vent and get things off of our chest. But we don't need to just do it over and 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 over. Exodus 13, 17. <laughs> and when Pharaoh let the people go, now watch this, God led them not by way of the land of the Philistines, although it was nearer. <laughs> Uh-oh. You mean, God, you could make this easier and you just won't? <laughs> well, what's that all about? I thought you loved people. I thought you were merciful and good and kind, so why are you... Why don't you just get rid of this situation? I know you could if you would. <laughs> okay, let's put it back up. God led them not the easy route, for God said, lest the people change their purpose when they see war and return to Egypt. Now here was the bottom line. When they came out of Egypt, God wanted to take them into the promised land, but the promised land was occupied. And so the word possess, when the Bible says possess the land, the word possess means that you have to first dispossess the current occupants. So what that meant was they weren't just going to float into the promised land and live there floating around on a glory cloud. They had to do war with the current occupants and drive them off. And God said, you're not ready for that. 
See, sometimes we want things that we're going to have to really battle the devil in order to have, and we want the thing, but we don't know the first thing about battling the devil. Some people want to be out casting out devils, and they don't even have authority over a sink full of dirty dishes. Maybe some of you ought to clean your house before you worry about your ministry. <laughs> well, I want, to, I want to be the worship leader in church. I think I've got a much better voice than the person that's singing, and God, that's my vision, and I don't understand why you don't at least let me in the, in the choir and part of the worship team, and then maybe I can move up to worship leader. Eh. You can tell God what you want, and He'll bring it to you at the right time. You don't need to promote yourself. Well, what am I supposed to do in the meantime? Clean your house. <laughs> Love your kids. Study the Word. Be good to your neighbors. <laughs> well, I did that once. How about the woman with the issue of blood? She didn't give up. Everybody told her to leave Jesus alone, but the Bible says she pressed through. She pressed through. Mark chapter 4, Jesus got in the boat with the disciples. He said, let us cross over to the other side. He went to the, a quiet place in the boat, took a nap. A violent storm of hurricane proportions arose. Oh, don't you love us, Jesus? How can you be asleep? Don't you care? We're never going to get to the other side. And I love, just a few verses later, it says, and they arrived at the other side. <laughs> you know, if Jesus says we're going to cross over to the other side, you will arrive on the other side. But how you make the journey is totally up to you. I didn't fall out of bed one morning and have this ministry. I thought that was how it was going to happen. I really thought after God spoke to me, you're going to go all over the world and teach the Word and have a large ministry. I thought, whoa, let's go, Jesus. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. I remember when I prayed one day, I remember still where I was at, oh, God, please, please, please. I mean, I was just... You know, I wasn't really all that young when God called me to do this. I was like already in my 30s, and I didn't even start this ministry until I was 42. And uh, so don't tell me you're too old or your time has passed you by. I don't want to hear that. Don't even bother telling me you got too many kids because I had four. And one of them, when I started, I mean, I was in ministry 10 years before that, but I was working for other people. When God called me to start this ministry, I had a baby who actually is now the CEO of, oversees all the television and the media and all the stuff that you guys see. And, and uh, I started with him on my hip. So don't tell me you can't do anything because, 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 because. Let's go back to what we said last night. You make your mind up, you can do anything God tells you to do. I said, if you make your mind up, and you cannot let other people discourage you, and you cannot let your circumstances discourage you, when he says cross over to the other side, you will. I recall when I was praying and asking God, just please God, I just want to teach just 12 times a month, if I could just teach the Word 12 times a month. Because I wasn't really getting too many offers back then. And I distinctly heard the Spirit of God say, are you sure you want that? Well, of course, I was like these guys that wanted to sit one on the right hand and one on the left hand to Jesus. He said, you don't know what you're asking for. See, I didn't have any idea back then about the responsibility side of all this. My little hour of fame here or my half hour on TV or whatever it is, is such a small part of all of this. The most part of it is the part that nobody sees. I'm not on television just because I want to be a movie star. Actually, I thought it'd be funny to tell you, this year I've had two offers to be in movies and turned them both down. 
They wanted me to play somebody's mother. I said, no, thank you. I've already got enough spiritual kids out there. I don't need to be somebody else's mother. And I feel like I'm already all of your mothers, so. Now, you know, I'm not saying I would never do that, but the point is I could have been in the movies. I don't want to. That's not what I'm doing this far. <laughs> With all my heart, I want to see you have what Jesus died for you to have and be what he died for you to be. I want to see you have the life that Jesus died for you to have. Oh, he paid a terrible price for our freedom, and we cannot spend our life wandering around in the wilderness, going around and around the same stupid mountain. It's time to take responsibility. Stand up and be men and women of God and set our mind right and make decisions and refuse to let your mind be a garbage dump for Satan. You mean more to us at Joyce Meyer Ministries than you may ever know. We appreciate you and we thank our friends and partners for making this worldwide ministry possible. Together, we're feeding the hungry, clothing the poor, and presenting the gospel to the nations. Please contact us or visit JoyceMeyer.org today to share your prayer requests, find out more about our resources, see Joyce's conference schedule, and to join us in partnership as we share the love of Christ around the globe. The proceeding was paid for by the friends and partners of Joyce Meyer Ministries.